Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Let's Talk Magic. This is Chubster. It's at 2 o'clock here in Manila, Philippines. And, of course, it's uh, the usual uh, broadcast. But the thing is, it should supposed to be at 10. But right now, it's 2 o'clock. And thank you very much for those guys who are in right now, joining and watching tonight uh, today's broadcast. Thank you. Thank you very much from the bottom of my heart. Now, first of all, please don't forget to... Wait a minute. Like our official Facebook page, Chubster Flores Productions, and of course, and of course, that is all past episodes can be viewed upon our official YouTube channel, Chubster Flores Productions, as well. So it's only one thing to remember: Chubster Flores Productions on Facebook, Facebook, and of course, Chubster Flores Productions on YouTube. Okay, let me just uh, pin on some of the comments over here. Good afternoon to everyone who are joining us for today's uh, broadcast. This is episode number twenty-five, and for sure, you'll be. Uh, enjoying this interview later on because we will be featuring an entertainer an actor a writer a magician well later on you're going to meet this guy uh to the mcfee president uh, good afternoon thank you very much for watching robert the room my happen my yeah good afternoon and of course he's watching all the way from angeles city in pampanga good afternoon to mj maayong ugtu okay thank you very much guys for watching Glenn Bailey Alaho from Hawaii. Thank you very much. Okay, Glenn, I know it's 8 o'clock, so you better stay up. You better finish this uh, interview now, okay? Don't sleep on me, man. And of course, Chris Lina. Chris Lina, nasangka. Good morning. It's good afternoon, man. Good afternoon, Chris Lina. Thank you very much for watching. Let's talk magic. Frank Tuglas again. Oh, thank you very much. Frank, keep safe, my friend. Thank you very much for joining in. Okay. First of all, guys, magandang gabi again. This is episode number 25. Well, off topic, not magic news, but the Philippines just won another silver medal in boxing. Congratulations to Carlo Paalam, who won second, uh, who won the bronze medal in boxing. So, Carlo, thank you very much for keeping up the good work. And uh, hold on, I need to. Uh, the thing is, the dog is knocking right at the door right now, and there's no one to open the door. But anyway, let me just take it out for a while. And what else? What else? What else? Uh, uh, oh wait, wait, wait. I'm, I'm getting lost right now. Hold on. Let me just call my, my, uh, hold on. Yeah, sorry about that, guys. Sorry about that. Okay. Uh, some other comments coming in. Oi, Sean Katangay, Sean, maraming salamat. Thank you very much for watching the stream. Again, this is episode number 25. If you are watching from outside the Philippines, please do let us know. Just comment in. My guest later on will be Mr. Robert Bax. And don't forget, if you have any questions about Mr. Robert Bax, Please feel free to type it in at the comment box and I'll be happy to read it for him later on as we go along with the broadcast. Okay, first up, my good friend Juan Lu will be, uh, again, I would like to uh, promote the show of my good friend Juan Lu. It is called, oh, wait, let me just take this out for a while. It's called The Puppet Stories with Nicolo. And uh, Nicolas' guest for this Monday will be... Uh, Wait, I'm I'll I'll be I'm gonna be having a hard time reading the name. Van Shidorum. Sorry about that, ma'am. I cannot read I, I don't want to murder the name, so just read the name. And they will be Nicholas Guest this coming Monday. The broadcast time is 5 30 p.m. You can watch it on the new channel, Puppet Stories with Nicolo. Again, this is coming from a good friend, Wandu. Again, Wandu, maraming salamat. And don't forget our broadcast next week. If today we started at 2 p.m., next week, well, my broadcast time will be at 11 a.m. Because, you know, guys, again, my guests are just doing me a great, a huge favor. First of all, for them, grant me the interview. And, of course, I would like to, in order for me to accommodate them, of course, I will have to adjust their time. So, next week, 11 a.m., my guest for next week will be none other than the silly magician, the silly billy guy. He is known other than... Mr. David K. This will be on August 14, Entertaining Children, Magic and Comedy, David K. Or a.k.a. Silly Billy. He will be my guest next week. So don't forget, next week is 11 a.m., 11 o'clock in the morning. Again, thank you very much for watching. Okay. First of all, before I introduce you, my uh, guest for this afternoon's broadcast, I would like to thank some of my good friends for supporting Let's Talk Magic. And here they go. Philippine magic scene for the latest news and updates in Philippine magic. Don't forget to go there to go to their Facebook page, Philippine Magic Scene, and don't forget to follow the page, Philippine Magic Scene, the latest news in Philippine magic. 
Lasco Home Security. the best money shop of combo in the whole of Metro Manila. You can visit their store at 408 Quezon. Oh no, by the way, they're only right now available at the favorite delivery apps like Zada or... Okay, right now, I'm having internet problem. Ay, 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 ay. The movers of Philippine Magic, the Press Digitators. You may visit their Facebook page at www.thepressdigitators.com or Facebook page, The Press Digitators. Okay, and of course, finally, DB Magic Shop. Serving the needs of Filipino magicians and hobbyists, you may uh, check out their Lazada and Shopee pages, DV Magic Shop, for your magical needs only here in the Philippines. Okay. Well, guys, please pardon me again. I'm having some problems with my connection on uh, StreamYard. Hold on. I just got hold of a message. Let me just read the message first. Again, I think uh, we're having some problems. Wait, hold on. Okay, there you go. Just reply to that one. Not now, not now, not now. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Let me see what's been happening again. It's been happening again. I'm losing my connection. I don't know why. I am not I'm losing I'm not losing my mind, but we're losing my connection. But anyway, thank you very much for those who are joining us. Hey, we have our uh, my good friend from Tahanan, John Santana. Thank you very much, sir. I hope you'll be uh, staying up. During the entire broadcast, John, and of course, Pablo, Magician Olga, Olbap. Yan. Good afternoon. So once again, my guest for this afternoon is Mr. Robert Max. I'm just waiting for him. He just lost his connection a while back. I'm just waiting for him to uh, join me back here in the stream. So guys, if you have anything to, uh, if you want to do some shout outs, just type in at the comment box and I'll be happy to read them for you. Uh, what else? Uh, Mm -hmm. Oh, by the way, last week, one of my viewers said, Wala ka bang stars to, for us to send? Well, actually, I'm not yet qualified, but I just made this one up. Baka mamaya, may gusto. I don't know, ha? So, yeah, no. Ay, hindi yan. Sorry. Ayan, no. Baka may gusto lang. Uh, baka lang. Baka lang may gusto. I'm not sure. Some of you guys are wondering, why asking, how come we cannot give you stars? Well, actually, I'm not yet qualified, but anyway. You can reach me through that one. <laughs> anyway, it's just a... And I just don't mind that one. Okay, guys. First of all, my guest for tonight, for today, is I think he's broadcasting all the way from California. But for you to, more, to know more about our guest, here is his promo reel, Robert Back's promo reel. Here we go. We know it doesn't matter how they try to tear us down. Caldwell Banker is the best. Oh, now you like me. Thank you. Open your hands, everybody at one. that bound a family together. Because he said what you were was one big happy family. What long have you been married for? Oh, no wonder. All right, six years of marriage, that could dull anybody's senses. All right, so for you, I will do uh, this. This is it, ladies and gentlemen. As State Farm Bank tells you all about how you can save money on your vehicle loans. The Porterville producers realized there was money to be made. The money.
Well, guys, there you have it. He is, well, from corporate to kids show to stage magic to acting. Well, actually, he's, a, he's, a, he's the total entertainer, the total funny guy. Entertainer, actor, magician, writer. Uh, wait, I lost him once again. Anyway, well, let's, just, let's just wait for him. Uh, that's the problem with the new normal right now. It's internet. Sometimes the connection is good. Sometimes the connection is bad. But first of all, John Santana, thank you very much for the wonderful stars that you gave me. Wow, dami yan, ha? One, two, three, four, five, six. That's more than a dozen stars. Thank you very much, my friend. It's so touching. <laughs> okay, let's just wait for our guest to join us back over here. So once again, if you guys are watching from outside the Philippines, please do let me know. Just comment in at the comment box and I'll be happy to uh, read your comments out. Uh, once again, good afternoon to everyone who is watching. This is episode number 25 of Let's Talk Magic. My name is Chubster. Uh, again, don't forget next week, my guest will be Silly Billy. Uh, it's a kid show and family entertainer. For So for those guys who are watching right now who is into kid show magic, don't forget... It's David K. Silly Billy entertaining children with magic and comedy. Our broadcast time will be at, two, at 11 p.m. So check that out. 11, uh, 11 p.m. 11 a.m. Wait, wait. What? And I am back. Sorry about that, guys. I don't know what's happening with the connection as of the moment. Uh, I lost the feed of Mr. Uh, Baxter. Then there you go. There you go. Hold on. Hold on. Let me just insert this back over here. Yeah, but I'm gonna do. Sorry about that. If I'm doing it like this on the screen, my bad. My bad. Sorry about that. Okay. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Okay. Let me just uh, put this back. Hey, yeah, 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 yeah. See, no, I can't even put it back. Okay, there you go. Yeah, sorry about that, guys. I also went, my my uh, video is also, uh, there's also something wrong with my video a while back. But anyway, let me just take that out one more time. Okay, there you go, there you go. Thank you very much, guys. Okay, here we go. Uh, yeah, silly beauties, uh, we have uh, some comments coming in. Bax is a great guy, and his products are super. I own several of his tricks. Whoa. Frank, okay. I should see that in Frank's hideaway anytime soon. I should be seeing that. Okay, another comment from, uh, yeah, Silly Billy. We'll talk about Silly Billy in a short while, but anyway, my guest for today is, of course, again. Uh, oh, welcome back. Thank you very much, sir. Okay, here we go. My guest for tonight, my today. <laughs> see, I'm getting all mixed up. My guest for today, at the end, is a total funny guy. An entertainer, a magician, an actor, and a writer. Guys, put your hands together. A virtual round of applause for the one and only Mr. Robert Bax. Robert Bax, hi, sir. Good afternoon, and welcome to Let's Talk Magic. Chubster, salamat po. I am so grateful to you for having me on your show. I thank you very much. I enjoy watching your show. I enjoyed uh, the one with Jeff McBride. 
uh, before that with um, uh, Christian Hurst. Again, I'm honored to be here. Salamat Paul. Thank you so very much for having me. Well, sir, the honor is all mine. And again, thank you very much for agreeing to do this lecture. Even though we personally don't know each other, we know we know each other virtually on Facebook. Okay. Still, you granted me to do this interview. And again, the honor is all mine. Maraming salamat then for agreeing to do this, uh, this interview. So, first of all, sir, how are you doing? How's this pandemic treating the business in, on, your, on your side? I... First, I must congratulate you. I follow the Olympics. Uh, I know that a, uh, a, a Manila uh, a person won, uh, was it weightlifting? Is that correct? Yes, we have a gold medalist. Uh, her name is Hydrin Diaz, uh, gold medal in the Olympics, the first ever gold medal in the Philippines for the okay. Philippines. Okay. So I am doing wonderfully. I live in Los Angeles, California, near the Magic Castle. I have been wow. at the Magic Castle. I hate to say, since I'm a very young man for over 25 years, um, I, I am a very lucky and fortunate man. Uh, I have a garage. This is not my where I perform my Zoom shows. I have a garage just behind this wall where uh, I perform shows online. And of course, for the past 15 months, I have been performing shows live, but only outdoors. Mm. I'm an expert in doing shows outdoors. The weather is normally nice here in Los Angeles, so most of the year we can do shows outdoors. Well, we have a comment over here. So some of the guys are really into your products. Huh? Newspaper um, is my go-to newspaper. It's great to see here, here Robert. Yeah. Uh, Jeff, McBride, you... Jeff McBride just taught my newspaper tear in his class. Oh. And uh, Penn and Teller perform my newspaper tear in their show in Las Vegas and on their TV show Fool Us. Uh, I did not invent paper tears. I just invented a very wonderful, fast, and easy way of doing a flash restoration newspaper tear for the working pro. It's a wonderful, mm. but I just do so many shows. I want to be able to set it up, do the trick, and then reset it for my next show as easily as possible. If you, for those guys who are wondering what type of flash newspaper is that, well, plain and simple, you can visit, of course, Mr. Robert's. Robert Bax's website. Here we go at robertbax.com slash shop. Just look for the newspaper tier. And of course, he is also on Facebook at uh, Robert Bax. So please don't forget. If you need to buy something like the one he's talking about, well, endorsed by Oni Karkamu. <laughs> it's Robert Bax's uh, newspaper tier. And, uh, okay. Silly Billy likes my products too. And I must say nice things about Silly Billy. Uh, he has been a great inspiration for me. Silly Billy and I know each other. I think since we're teenagers in New York City, we both started doing uh, children's birthday party shows around the same time. Well, that I, I really that's the first time that I learned about that and how, well, how what's up? What what the coincidence? Because next week he'll be my guest for the show. Wow. I'm originally from New York City, uh, Brooklyn, New York. Oh, Brooklyn. And yes, I I know Silly Billy. Yeah, since we were all but children. Yes. He does an excellent. So Brooklyn, you're you must be near Showbiz Enterprises. George Schindler, of course. I know yeah. since I'm a, a little boy, and he was old then, just so you know. <laughs> but all but still young, huh? Uh, okay, yes. tell you what. Young at heart. Okay, you mentioned you grew up in Brooklyn, maybe near George's uh, shop. Uh, my first question is: How do you get started into magic? Uh, I will tell you. What's the story behind Robert Bax becoming a successful and uh, now sought after magician and entertainer? It is a wonderful story. In New York City, where I was growing up, there was a magic shop. A okay. magic shop that had been there for over a hundred years. Mm. It owned by Houdini himself. And after Houdini died, it was bought in the 1930s by a man named Al Flosso. Oh, okay. When I got there, 50 years later, Al Flosso was still there. <laughs> 85 years old, with gusts up to 90. <laughs> and the first thing I did when I walked in, he goes, kid, kid, here's a dollar. Run down to the street, get me a lemonade from the store, come back up. 
I, I didn't know I hadn't even said anything, but he gave me a dollar and I ran downstairs and I bought him a lemonade and I brought it back up to him. And then he went, kid, kid, here's money. Go to the post office on the corner, buy me some stamps, come right back. So there was a post office on the corner. I bought him stamps and I brought them right back. Next thing I knew, I was working at Al Flosso's magic shop. It was a wonderful experience. They don't make magic shops like this anymore. He would let me get lunch. He would let me get the stamps. He would never let me sweep the floor. He would go, kid, don't touch that dust. Houdini once stood in that dust. <laughs> to this day, I still have a small vial of the dust, dust. over from Flosso's magic shop. I worked there when I was in uh, junior high school, and, and after Al Flosso died, I continued to work there for his son, Jackie Flosso. Mm. Uh, it was quite an experience because all the famous old magicians knew Flosso's magic shop, and they would come in, and here I was, this punk teenager behind the counter, and I was learning all the secrets of magic. It was quite an experience. They, they don't make magic shops like that anymore. So it must be a, a very, uh, I mean, for me, if I'll be working in a magic shop, well, for me, that's, it's like going into heaven for me because everything is there. And uh, so the thing is, you work there, you, you do the demo, you demo some of the magic stuff there. But the thing is, do you know all the props? I mean, all, of course, it's, it's, it's a huge magic shop. So do you know how to uh, demo all the props there or depends? Well, that, that was the best part, because when customers were not there, I could pick up all the tricks. You can play around. Play with them. I go, oh, I don't have to buy this. Now I know how it works. <laughs> oh, here's one like this, and this goes like, oh, that's clever. I want to buy one of those. <laughs> Most of the time, I made no money, because all the money I was supposed to get paid, I would spend on yeah. magic tricks at the magic shop. So I'm, I'm pretty sure I never came home with any cash money, only with magic tricks. But I was very, very happy to do that. Okay. Since you work in the magic shop, uh, what was the first magic item that you own or brought or, or bought? I know exactly what it was. I wish I still had it. It was something called the Xeno Production Box. It was a little orange and black box about this high. It had two black panels on it that you pulled off to show the shell of the box empty. And then you put the panels back on the box and you could do a large production of silks or anything else that would fit in the, we're, we're magicians here, right? I, I can say anything that yes. would fit inside the secret compartment. Yes, yes, that's it. Yeah. Oh, wait, wait, I have a comment over here coming from Frank and he's a music dream, a miser's dream maybe. It's a wonderful routine and he learned the trick from uh, Alfonso. Ah, from Alfonso. Props are highly uh, high quality too. Al, Al Flosso was famous for his miser's dream routine. The routine that mm. I do is not Al Flosso's. Al Flosso grew up in the, was doing his routine in the 1930s and the 1940s. In those days, you could be, how should I say politely, rough with a kid. He would uh, tug on the kid and pull on the kid and he would load things into the kid's jacket. Nowadays, we don't touch children. Yes. Quite. But in those days, it was great. It was very funny. And that routine had taken him all around the world. And he showed me some of the work on it. And what I've done with it is make it my own, as every magician should do. We all start out by copying what we see other people do, whether you buy Silly Billy's props, whether you buy a Jeff McBride's props. But then you don't want to be the next Jeff McBride. You don't want to be the next David Kay or Silly Billy. You don't even have your own image. Robert Baxt. You yes, want to yes. trick your own. And that's what you do. You change it. You add to it. You, you polish it. You, you work on it. It takes time. Very few tricks come together overnight. And the only way to really work on them is to do them in front of an audience. Yes. That's the problem with magic. You can practice all you want in your living room. You can practice all you want in your bedroom. No one has ever gotten famous out of their bedroom. You have to do this in front of a live audience. So the more shows you can do, the better a magician you will be. 
I was very lucky. I started doing shows for money when mm -hmm. I was 14 years old in oh, Brooklyn. Him, huh? Yeah, when you're 14 years old, of course, no one will hire you to perform except for six-year-olds, right? You know, 20, adults tw are 25 years old aren't going to hire a 14-year-old kid, but they'll hire a 14-year-old kid for an eight-year-old's birthday party. Yeah. So I lots and lots and lots of kids' birthday parties in those days. By the time I was 17, I had bought myself a car, a used car, an Ooh. old car. But, but I'm a 17-year-old in New York with his own car. And I think I had more money in my pocket than my father did. As a matter of fact, it's a great story. Before I had my own car, my father would drive me to my shows. And the first time he found out that I made $50 for doing an hour magic show, my father was getting ready to retire. Because he had fifty dollars for an hour's work, and I had to explain to my father carefully that I could not make fifty dollars an hour, eight hours a day, forty hours a week, the week. way. He was. But I only wish my father was alive now, because if he saw that I have a wonderful career, that I've traveled around the world, that I've been on TV, that I've I've hobnobbed with celebrities, that I made a fine and wonderful living from magic. My father would be so proud. He's dead many, many years, but I know somewhere up in heaven, he smiles down upon me. Well, that's a very, very nice story, and thank you very much for sharing that. Well, uh, I've got a similar story to mine, because in our case, magicians here in the Philippines before are often yep. uh, referred to, there's a term, peria magician. It's called carnival magicians. And yes. before, when you say you're a carnival performer, when people look up to you, you're in the lower bracket. So from time to time when magicians are I mean, getting better at their craft, so until uh, the level of the magic here in the Philippines went up, and uh, since there are already lots of magic clubs here, so we have somewhat uplifted the so-called art of entertainment, the art of magic here in the Philippines. So... And like what you mentioned a while back, we are not, if during those times, you're allowed to touch the kids on their shoulders, something like that. Well, nowadays, I think you, the kid can already call a police. Yes. Dial yeah. one -one. I'm being abused or molested by this, some of these guys over here. There, there's a, a famous magic trick called the uh, uh, magician's assistant, where you dress the child up like a, a little magician and you stand behind him and you operate him. <clears throat> that trick is no longer appropriate, I think. Uh, so yeah, the instant magician is yeah, yeah, I know you retired from people shows because even though I know the magician is not molesting the child, even though I know the policeman should not be called, you don't want anyone in the audience thinking that. So you have to be very, very careful these days. Of yeah, course, that, that's the right thing. That's the right uh, thinking for you to do. Of course, you have to be careful right now. Of course, but but again, it just makes me more. Uh, creative of things mm -hmm. that I can't do. For instance, this past 14 months, all the wonderful routines that I used to do, like pulling coins out of a kid's ear, I couldn't do anymore. There were so many audience participation tricks where I would have a child help me and a child would hold something and he would take my breakaway wand and now I can't do those anymore. But that's okay. I've come up with all sorts of other tricks and maybe later on I will demonstrate uh, something for you. Oh, you guys better watch out for that one. Okay, I have a comment here. Actually, it's just a side comment. My first taste of performing for people was performing, oh, just performing for people at malls. I mess up a lot. My hands shook and sweat. I'm sleeping. One of the best days of my life. Well, uh, again, John, thank you very much for sharing your uh, comments over here. Now, the thing is, uh, since he mentioned uh, he messed up a lot of this, some magic stuff, uh, let's go to that question later on. Are you a full-time magician? Yes. Not only am I a full-time magician, but I have never had a real job in my life. I started performing for money when I was 14. By the time I was 17, I had a car. I was doing shows. I went to college, and I put myself through college mm -hmm. with that I made doing magic shows. My parents were poor. We were not rich people. My parents could not afford to send me to driving school, let alone college. 
uh, after college, I even made enough money. Uh, well, I had to borrow money, but I was uh, to go to law school. I wow. actually, yeah, I actually have a law degree. I've never used it. When I graduated law school, I gave the diploma to my mother and I said, here it is the most expensive square yard of wallpaper <laughs> any son has ever bought their mother. This is for you. I'm off to be a magician. My mother did not laugh. Um, as a matter of fact, the, the best part of the story is when you graduate law school, you are still not a lawyer. Mm. Once you graduate law school, you must take a test. In America, it is called the bar exam. Yes. Um, yes. A very extremely difficult test. Uh, people study for months after law school just to pass this test. Well, at the same time that the bar exam was held in New York City, where I was growing up, ISM was being held in Europe. And I had a choice. ISM <laughs> was only being held once every three years. Yes, the Olympics of magic. But the bar exam comes around every six months. <laughs> so the choice was FISM. Or the bar exam. And I go for FISM. <laughs> and I came back with a trophy. Now, Whoa. this actually is the trophy I won before FISM. This is the first prize in the gold medal competition of the National International Brotherhood of Magicians Convention. IBM. Yeah, to the IBM. The Lance Burton handed me this trophy on stage. And to this day, it still has Lance Burton's DNA on it. I have invested it in all these years. So having been the American prize winner, which which is like being Miss America, I yeah. thought, okay, I'll I'll go to Europe and enter the FISM competition. And I, fortunately, I did not have to wear a bathing suit like, you know, Miss Universe or anything like that. But I came back with a FISM trophy for comedy. And now mm -hmm. at that FISM trophy for comedy, I had a career. At that point in New York City, while there were many magicians, there weren't many famous magicians. It was like me and Jeff McBride and just a handful of others, the close-up workers, Derek Dingle, David Roth and stuff. But now whenever they go, oh, we need one of the world's greatest magicians here in New York, it was like, oh, Robert Baxt, FISM winner. <laughs> well, we're, we're, we want to maybe hire Jojo the Magical Clown. Is what? He a FISM winner? No, only Robert <laughs> Baxt. Is a FISM winner. So that was wonderful. Now, the important thing that most people don't realize is no one has ever seen me do that act in the last 25 years. I retired that act. It was a totally different type of act than I do now. And I want to talk about it because it's influenced why I do what I do now. Okay. That act was a silent act. Think of Johnny Thompson. It mm. was that type of routine manipulation with, with magic, with all such a pretty silks, where I wore a top hat and tails, and everything went wrong. But Ooh. every time a trick went wrong, there was an out. There was something miraculous that happened that made the trick that went wrong even better. Better, yeah. And on top of having that out, that magical thing that happened to make the trick that went wrong even better, every time I did a good trick, I pinned a medal on myself. And okay. then when it went wrong, I took the medal off. But when the trick got better because of my magical clever thing, I pinned a bigger medal on myself. <laughs> and throughout the routine, the medals got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So at the end of the act, the table blew up. Became, we had flash pots on it. Became a giant metal seven feet high. I walked off stage, came back on. I was wearing a king's crown, a scepter. I had a cape. Um, when I opened up the cape, there were like 300 medals. Medals. By this cape. <laughs> All the magicians loved it. It was exactly that type of variety act that you don't see anymore. The only problem with it was... It was a 12 and a half minute act. Really, just beautiful, silent manipulation. But it took two hours of setup. Oh, oh my God. I, I was a nervous wreck before every show. If I was on the show, and even though I was on it in the second half, I would have to start preparing this act and folding all the silks and 
putting all the body loads in and threading all the threads around my body. I, I could not sit down for an hour before the show because there were so many things in these secret pockets. And then every time I did the show, it was a silent act. This is important. Yes. Look at me talking right now. I, I can speak some Tagalog. Salamat po. I, I can speak Japanese. I can speak Spanish, French, Saudi Arabian, Russian, Armenian. I can speak so many languages, but there I was doing a silent act. And I went to myself, when something what? goes wrong in the act that isn't supposed to go wrong, not one of the planned wrong things, but something really did break, I have nothing to say and nothing to do. I can't ad lib. I can't tell a joke or something. It's supposed to be a silent act. And there were so many things that could go wrong. So many things that could break. The thread could break. The reel could not work. The, the flash pot could not go off. The, the steel that I'm going for, my underneath my coat, I could not make. And I had nothing. And it drove me crazy. Literally. I had nightmares where I woke up in a sweat that things had gone wrong and I had nothing to do. Or the opposite. That they were going, and now please welcome to the stage... Monsieur Robert Bax. And I'm going, no, I'm not ready. I'm still putting me <laughs> in my jacket. So, I'm not some rolling up. <laughs> to this day, my entire way of looking at magic has changed 180 degrees. Okay. Now, in my show must have minimal setup and all but instant reset. Mm. I want all my energy to go into the performance all my energy to go into the show. Not I was up. Exhausted, spending two hours setting up for that act. I had little energy left to do the show. And then when I finished the 12 and a half minutes, I was dead. <laughs> now, by making my act things that need no reset, that can be reset easily. I can do an entire... Now, I say the opposite. It used to take two hours to set up for 12 minutes. Yes. Now, I could do a two-hour <laughs> show with 12 minutes of setup. Literally. My, my newspaper tailor keeps talking about the one of the things that makes it great is that I can set it up in under one minute. Most oh, newspapers wow. rubber cement and glue and paste things together. It takes 20 minutes and stuff, but I can set it up in a minute. Of course, I practiced it, but even when someone buys it, if it takes uh -huh. them three times as long to set it up, it's only three minutes to set up as opposed to 15 minutes of rubber cement and glue and Stuff like that. So my entire show is like that. It makes my life so much easier because now I know I can concentrate on the actual performance of the show and not have to worry about, oh, is that thing under my pocket? Is it going to pull out? Is the thread going to break? Is the battery not going to work? Is the radio remote control not going? Ah! <laughs> I'm getting a little and nervous with, uh, now thinking about it. And with all those medals, I can't imagine how heavy your outfit is during that time. It's hard for you to walk with those heavy stuffs inside. And wait, that was the other thing. It was a 12-minute silent act, and I remember when I was putting it together when I was a kid, I went, oh, well, this won't weigh much. There's just some playing cards and some silk <laughs> and some billy. The case was 100 pounds. Ooh. Nowadays, you can't even get on an airplane with a 100-pound case. Yes. They've now, in those days, the, the limit wasn't 50 pounds the way it is now. Uh, what is that, 22 kilograms or something like that. Something like that, yes. To, yeah, you used to be able to get on the plane for under 100 pounds. So I, I wouldn't do that act, even if you paid me. I, as fact, that's the last time I did it. I did it in Japan about 15, 16 years ago. They paid me enough money. It was worth my while. I did it, but I won't do it again. Uh, yeah, I like my style much better now. I just walk out, everything's set. I just do it. When I put it back, it's all but reset. If I have to reset my entire show, it's only going to take me five or 10 minutes at the very yeah, most. Uh, Backs flat me. and place big on the stage. That's it. Peace of mind. Peace of mind. As a fact, do you have a video clip of me performing like at a casino or something? Maybe yes, we should play. Hold on. By the all way, right. again, before I show that to you guys, you are watching Let's Talk Magic. This is episode number 25. My guest for today is Mr. Robert Bax. He is broadcasting all the way from California, and I'll be showing, yeah, and I'll be showing you a clip of his performance on uh, Morongo Casino. So, guys, please watch this one. Here we go. I can watch myself. Anyway, <laughs> I 
a trick you will not see much of in the future, because you can't do this when this happens. The trick where it looks like the newspaper is being written. The trick where it sounds like the newspaper is being written. The trick where tomorrow you will say, I could have sworn I saw that funny guy at the Morocco Casino ripping the newspaper. But even though you see the newspaper ripped into a million, million, little teeny tiny bits, even though you see individual ripped up pieces, you people only applaud and go crazy for me, Mr. Man. If I can take all the pieces and I can do uh, this. Thank you. That's one of the smallest sets of the mutilated parasol that just that I just see right now. It's so small, um, huh? Here, well, let's let's talk about that routine then for a moment. First, notice the little box on me next to on my table is twelve inches square, and mm. more than just that four minutes, I have enough material in that box to do forty minutes of material. So everything really does pack small, but play, play big. big. 
And again, while it's nothing special to another magician, you could hear that crowd go wild for those tricks because I'm, I'm a showman. I'm making those tricks great. I'm making those tricks that to a magician, they would go, eh, yeah, so i would seen that. The audience is going, wow, we've never seen that. And now I don't want to stop anyone from going out and buying an expensive set of mutilated parasols. Please go ahead. Magic dealers need the money. <laughs> I'm just telling you that the reason that set of uh, umbrellas is small is because rather than buying a magician set of mutilated parasols, I just went out and bought some real umbrellas and I switched them. Again, magician's going, well, that's not as good because the ones you buy from the magic shop, they have things that fit inside and that thing. <laughs> I won't stop you from buying it. <clears throat> know that it's so much easier with two real umbrellas and just switching them like that. Mm. But you do it the way you want to do it. Each one of us is an artist. This is important now. Some people, when they paint a painting, they paint the grass green and the sky blue. Yes. And their paintings probably hang in a hotel room somewhere. But when Van Gogh painted the sky... He painted the sky purple and the trees were blue and his paintings hang in museums. Yes. So you don't have to do what everybody else does. You can be an artist. You can make it your own and your art doesn't have to be different. It just has to be you to decide how much you want to please the audience mm -hmm. and how you want to please yourself. If you're only pleasing the audience, you are like a prostitute. <laughs> you are just giving the audience what they want. Yes. But when you're an artist and you give them what's in your heart, when you give them what's important to you, then you're not a prostitute. It's like a love affair. You're mm. making love to the audience. And the reason I bring this up is I think you also have a clip of me doing the Professor's Nightmare Rope Trick. You have that? Yes. Could you yeah, show me? Yeah. Uh... Watch this. It's Robert Bax performing Professor's Nightmare. Check this out, guys. From a long time ago, when I was younger and thinner. <laughs> okay, here we go, guys. It, that came from him, not from me. Okay, here we go. Check it out. All this stuff that I've been doing, pretty funny. <laughs> but there's something serious I'd like to do. Because it's about family. Maestro? I'll be there. <laughs> you see, when I was a kid, not much older than some of the kids here today. In my family, there were three of us growing up together. There was me, I was the baby. There was my brother, he was the middle child. And there was my sister, she was the oldest. Now you know, I hated being the baby, everyone. I felt it wasn't fair, I never got to do anything. And my brother hated being the middle child. He felt it wasn't fair. He always got overlooked. And my sister hated being the oldest because, well, she had to babysit the two of us. But you know, my father was a very wise man. He said it didn't matter who was the baby, who was the middle child, and who was the oldest. Because one day he said, just like magic, we would all on that day he said we would all be big and tall and strong and we would all be exactly the same. Whoa. And he said people would applaud at that moment. Thank you the other thing my father said was when that day came that we were all grown up, that even though we were adults, we should never, ever, ever forget that it was family that tied us together. My father said to always remember that it was love that bound us together as a family. Because, my father said, when you remember that family was the most important thing, you were never three separate individuals. Oh no, my father said. How did he put it? He said what you were was something much greater than the whole. What you were was one, big, happy, 
family, and that was the most important thing uh, of all. So my father said it never ever really mattered who was the baby. And my father said it never ever mattered who was the middle child. And my father said it didn't matter who was the oldest. The only thing that mattered, my father said, was that we kids never forget the most important thing of all. That he loved us all the same. Everybody, if you'd like to see me do this routine next Father's Day, June 17th, on The Tonight Show with Jay Leno, pray for me. Okay. <laughs> nice, nice take on that one. Huh? Of course, because think of it. Most magicians, not all, but many, do the tricks only for the sake of magic. Yes. It, here's the rope. Now it's short. Now it's big. Worship me. Here's your card. Now it's gone. Now it's back again. Applaud for me. A guitar player with his guitar does not go the A note, the B note, the C note, the note. D note. Thank you. What he does is he takes those notes, he puts them together into a song, and he adds some lyrics to it. And he tells a story about his girlfriend or his heartbreak or anything else that people can relate to. Now, rather than just being about his ability to pluck on strings and make music, it now becomes something that the audience, the listeners, can bond with. Well, some of my magic is flash magic at the opening, like you saw me do before with the newspaper and the umbrellas and the rings and stuff. But then a little bit of flash magic. After that, I want to get them to get to know me. So yes. when I tell that story about my brother and my sister and my father and me, now they go, oh, this guy's a person like us. Yeah. That's the most important part about magic. The problem for me with magic has always been at some point, because you do magic and the audience does not do magic, it's off putting to them. You're doing strange things that they can't. So they don't bond with you. Even though most of them cannot play the guitar so well and most of them cannot sing, they think they can sing. Or where they go, well, you know, I sing in the shower all the time. I, I sing at home. I whistle a tune. But this guy on stage who's singing, he is great. Right? Because they forget all the skill that's involved in learning to sing. They, You and I both know that just the way a magician has to practice for dozens of years to be mm. great, a singer has to do the same. But somehow, people don't think that. They think, oh, no, that guy was just born with a great voice. And they enjoy his music. But the very act of doing magic, they know, oh, no, this guy was locked alone in, a, in his room for seven years learning this. Didn't he date girls in, in school or anything like that? No, he was too busy doing this stuff. So I'm trying to always get over that off-putting, odd part about magic to get people to bond with me. And I find that makes mm. for a much better show than just magic for magic's sake. I see. Okay. When I was reading your bio, I saw that you are fluent in uh, Japanese language. Hi. Uh, I also Hi. saw that you also toured a lot in Japan. Of course, because I was doing this silent act that I told you about, that I won a FISM comedy trophy for, I performed in many different countries. I was in South America. Mm. I was on uh, television in Korea. I was everywhere where they still had those type of variety shows, I would do the act. Mm -hmm. Well, I went to Japan a couple of times and like the third or fourth time I was there, I didn't just fly in, do the television show and leave. I was at a place called the Yoshimoto Kogyo Gran Kinetsu, a big theater in a major city, Osaka, Japan. Osaka, Japan is like uh, Chicago, a large mm -hmm. major city, uh, the second largest city next to Tokyo. And I was there for six or eight weeks at a time. Mm -hmm. And it, I was doing the silent act. But then after the show was over, I had no one to talk to. <laughs> I was the only American on the show. And I said, I'm not going to sit here in my room doing this all day. And so I forced myself to learn a couple of words of the language. And with a couple of words of the language, I could go out and talk to people and, you know, have some fun and enjoy myself. 
And so I learned Japanese. And once I learned a little bit of Japanese, they went, oh, you're funny. Taihen <laughs> Okashi Desu. That's Japanese for Anato wo Taihen Okashi Desu. That's Japanese for you are funny. You can come back again. We have another show for you. And so every time I came back to Japan, I learned a little bit more Japanese. And I think I must speak it well enough that now I have a Japanese wife. Oh, uh, wow. I, well, I didn't even meet her in Japan. Uh, the ah. best, I met her in Los Angeles, where I live. Um, <laughs> while I can speak Japanese, the writing, the language is very okay. difficult. It is nothing like the English language. And I cannot read it. I, I can only read my name and a couple of... So one day I'm in a supermarket here in Los Angeles, a Japanese supermarket, and has all the Japanese foods. And there's a Japanese food that I like called okonomiyaki. 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 Uh, a pancake, a uh, pizza type dish with eggs. It's delicious. But I like it. And I asked a Japanese girl who was walking by, does this say okonomiyaki? And she said, yes, it does say okonomiyaki. I can make okonomiyaki. I went... Really? Can you make <laughs> for me? And that's how I met my wife. So, uh, yes, being able to speak a, a couple of different languages is a wonderful thing. Uh, I am fluent fairly in Spanish. Uh, I know how to say I'm an idiot in many languages. In German, ich bin ein Undumkopf. In French, uh, je suis un imbécile. Uh, I must learn how to say that in uh, Tagalog, of course. Uh, I know to say, uh, po, how are you? And, yes. so, and a couple other words, but, um, yeah, I will practice. Uh, I go, oh, let's see, uh, how, uh, how do I, uh, Pamahin? Sorry, excuse me for not knowing more Tagalog. I will uh, practice more because here in Los Angeles, of course, we also have many different ethnic communities. There is a large uh, a group from the Philippines here, and I do many one-year-old birthday parties for large Philippine families. Uh, we also have Russians here, Padmai Paruski, Spasiba. We have Armenians, Shad Shonohagalam, Minchnor Handipum. I just did a show for the royal family of Saudi Arabia this week here in Los Angeles. Uh, a very famous hotel called the Beverly Wilshire Hotel. And when I went, what room will they be in? They went, no, no, no. We have the so, entire third floor. And I went, oh, when you're rich, you don't take a hotel room. You take a <laughs> hotel floor. Yeah. The entire floor for all the... the entire floor. No, that, that was impressive, yes. Uh, so, yeah, that was a good gig. And again, yeah. I do the same stuff you've just seen me do. Um, simple stuff, but very effective. And they enjoyed it and tipped me heavily. So, yeah. Well, I hope you don't mind me asking, but how long have you been performing? Let's see. So I started, I think I must have hit Flosso's Magic Shop when I was 11 or 12. So that was 20 years ago. Oh, more than 20 years ago. <laughs> consider, yeah, yeah. consider 40 years ago. I'm, I'm much older than I look. I, I sat behind Methuselah in the third grade. I <laughs> babysat the infant Jesus. I valet parked the three wise men. Oh. <laughs> my my blood type has been discontinued. Okay, where I'm in old. I <laughs> I did close up magic on Noah's Ark. All right. I'm um I'm getting up there. Pretty much everywhere, huh? Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, uh, what you, else? you went into acting. I sorry, sorry to cut you. Okay, what was that? Go ahead, go ahead. I said you want I asked what else you would like to ask, and you said about acting. Yeah, you may. You played the part of Bernard in How I Met Your Mother. Now the thing is, uh, how did you get in? How did you get the part? And uh, do you miss acting on in front of the camera? It's different when you're acting on stage in front of a camera performing magic. Of course, it's different when you're acting as in acting, as in for a TV show, something like that. So, do you miss acting on TV? And how did you get to play the part of Bernard? Did you audition for it or what? Yes, yes, I did. Um... Let's start from the beginning. Uh, when I was in college, I didn't. I knew I wanted to be in show business because I was already doing magic tricks at the age of 11 and 14. And by the time I'm 17 and I'm in college, 18, 19, I studied acting. So my uh, undergraduate degree, my Bachelor of Arts is in acting. Um, so when I came out, I was living in New York. I moved to Los Angeles. There's another great story. We'll, we'll sidetrack for just a moment. I was never going to leave New York City. New York City is the most wonderful city in the world. 
anything you could ever possibly want is somewhere in New York New City, York. because that really is the center of attention. But one day in November in New York City, I get a phone call from the Magic Castle. Mm. Magic, besides having the Magic Castle, Magic Castle's big theater is only about 175 seats. They put on a big show every year in like a 2,000 seat auditorium. That show is called the It's Magic Show, and they do it only once a year. And someone tripped, died, or broke a leg or something, and I get a phone call on a Thursday. Could I come out to Los Angeles by Saturday to be on the It's Magic Show doing this act I won FISM with and stuff, right? All the, all the ritzy magic tricks and stuff. And I asked, how much will you pay me? And they told me, and I said, I'm coming. <laughs> November in New York is cold. It is wet. Mm. It is snowing. We are all wearing very thick clothes and I am freezing. Christmas is coming up and I know I will be doing a, a dozen shows every week and I will be driving my car through the sliding and I will be getting overheated and then put my coat back on. And when I get out to Los Angeles in November, it is 72 degrees. It is beautiful and everyone is wearing short sleeves. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm not going back. <laughs> it's supposed to be just a two week performance at the uh, It's Magic show somehow lasted six weeks because uh, I, after the It's Magic show, I then worked uh, the Comedy and Magic Club, uh, the, I worked the Magic Castle, I worked a couple of the gigs, and I just said, I'm moving to Los Angeles. So once I'm in Los Angeles, I am a member of the Screen Actors Guild. That is oh. the union for actors. And the wonderful thing about the Screen Actors Guild is once you're a union member, Every time you're seen on TV, when they rerun it, you get paid again. Oh, that is a wonderful thing. Because the money I have made from that one episode of How I Met Your Mother, because I am listed as a, a guest star. I am not just somebody in the background. I have lines. I talk to all the others. In fact, the girl on that show, How I Met Your Mother, her name is Allison Hannigan. She mm. is now the host on Penn and Teller's. So I'm waiting till I get on the show to go, hi, Allison, remember me? <laughs> I don't know if she'll remember me, but but I certainly have a bunch of photos of her and me from the set that day. Um, yeah. So being a member of the Screen Actors Guild, I often go out on auditions here in Los Angeles because that's the other reason I moved to Los Angeles. Los Angeles is the center of the universe for television shows and movies. New York is a big city but they don't do as much television production there. In New York City, they do Broadway shows, uh, yes. soap operas, some television, but for the most part, television and movies are here in Los Angeles. So I have auditioned many times and I've been on many small commercials that weren't seen everywhere. And uh, I've done radio voiceover work. Well, you've heard me say Monday, 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 you know, uh, come on down, you know. Um, but what, there was an audition, get this now, for How I Met Your Mother, if you remember the TV show, it's been off the air for like uh, five years now, but on its last season, uh, the, the Jason Siegel, the actor, Jason Siegel, the actor, played a lawyer in the show. Jason Siegel, the actor, also starred in the Muppet movie uh, after he did that show. So just in case you think he's long, tall, thin. Um, so they needed someone to be an actor, to play the part of his lawyer partner in the office. And the lawyer had to be a very tired, haggard and, <laughs> and lawyer because in the story, the Jason Siegel, the star of the show, and me, the other lawyer, we were the last lawyers there. All the other lawyers were fired and we had no work and we were manning the entire office by ourselves. So you had to look tired and worn out. And at this point, when I auditioned, my wife was pregnant. My wife mm. was pregnant with our son and I had not been sleeping because she was now seven and a half months pregnant. And every night we got no sleep because she was in pain and stuff. So when they called for someone who was haggard and looked tired and worn out, the timing was acting for me. And then one, now here's the problem. This is very important. When you're an actor, sometimes you hear people say, wow, you're great. You're one in a million. That means in Los Angeles, there are nine other guys just like you. So when <laughs> I went to the audition, 
there were nine other actors there also looking worn and tired and tired haggard and stuff who were also auditioning. But when I auditioned, because I was playing the part of a lawyer, I ad libbed a line. Something oh. didn't like, and I said something legalese. Oh, yeah, you know, we'll have to look up uh, Powell's graph versus the Long Island Railroad and check with the Supreme Court's president, I, which is a lawyer thing, because I knew, because I went to law school. Yes, you have a background. Right, and the producers went, oh, we like that. And I think that's how I got the part, as opposed to any of the other guys, that I was quick enough to ad lib and just come up with a line uh, for something that was the right line, and I looked very tired and haggard because my wife was pregnant with our uh, son. So yeah, I just got lucky. And uh, I've been in other television shows, but that perhaps is the most famous uh, one I'm on. I don't know if you have in the Philippines. Do you have Amazon? Yeah, uh, Amazon. There are a couple of episodes of uh, Amazon uh, television shows that I'm on. If you go in Amazon and search by actor Robert Baxt, there are two or three other episodes of uh, things I'm on. But that one, How I Met Your Mother, is the most famous. And again, the residuals keep coming in. It still gets shown, and I get a check for a couple of hundred dollars every time it airs, so I'm hoping I will put my son through college with some of them. <laughs> oh, by the way, how old, is your, how old is your son right now? It's still it's a kid, right? Eight years old now, eight years old. Wow, yeah. that's right, that's right, this must be eight years ago. Wow, wow, time flies. Uh, but uh, is he uh, is playing with some magic toys as, as of now? No, you don't want him to go into magic. That's it, listen to me closely. This is very important. I want my son to have such a happy childhood that he never has to go into show business. Oh, never. okay. Think of it. I don't know about you, Chubster. I only know my case and all the other magicians I know. There is no magician I don't know who didn't have at some point an unhappy childhood. They are asking for attention from an audience and doing magic tricks because at some point they're trying to make up for the fact that as a child, they didn't get enough attention. I want my son to get all the attention he wants. I want him to feel all the love he can possibly get so he can grow up and be a lawyer or a doctor or a dentist or an accountant or anything he wants. This is a very strange life and I don't recommend it. I'm very lucky that I've done well, but it's there's so many times. That here's, here's the problem with magic. You're out of work after every show. People mm. go, oh my God, you were great. Here's the money for the show. You're fired. We don't need you anymore. We only had yes. this party this one time. So you never know where your next job is coming from. Wow, that's a lot of pressure. Especially Again. right now, pandemic time, look. Of course, yes. No, no, I, I'm very lucky that I've been able to, to make it, but there have been times where I went, where's my next show coming from? Lucky for me, Correct. Correct. phone is always rung and someone calls or emails and texts and says, oh, you know, you, you're Rob Brax, we need you for something. And I was like, but a couple of times it's been tough. So yes, don't do this if you're looking to get rich and famous. Only do magic if you love it. Only yes. do magic if it's so important to you that you can't imagine doing anything else. I know, Lou Chubster, that one of the questions you like to ask your guests is what would they do if they weren't doing magic? Yes. In my case, if I were not doing magic... I would not be a lawyer. Oh. I would have to be something creative. It would have to be something where I get to be artistic, something where, because as much as I enjoy the performing, I also enjoy the creation of the tricks, the, the working on the tricks, the, the fine tuning of the tricks. I very often buy other magicians' tricks and routines because it's like buying the clothing off the rack. Mm. It won't fit me. The only way I can make the tricks fit me is if I come up with them and I tailor them for myself. Yes. So if I was not a magician, but I still wanted to be creative like that, maybe either a photographer mm -hmm. or a writer, a writer. That's what I would be because I, I have written many uh, scripts. I have, uh, I'll tell you one of my greatest scripts. I've actually got optioned. In Hollywood, sometimes you write a script and people go, oh, my God, that's great. We want to buy it from you, but we don't want to. We're not sure we're going to make the movie. We're just going to give you what's called an option on it, where for a year or six months, I give them the rights to the script that I won't sell to anyone else. 
and they get to decide if they want to make the movie. So the producer of the movie, The Transformers, there's a series of movies called The Transformers. Yes. And, uh, he also did a wonderful movie uh, called The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. Yep. He read a script that I wrote and uh, optioned it from me. I'll even tell you what the script is about since uh, you can't do it without me. Houdini. Remember I said I worked at Flosso's Magic Shop? Yes. I worked at Flosso's Magic Shop, and that had been owned by Houdini, and there was a bunch of Houdini stuff still there. And Houdini is buried in New York City in a cemetery next to the cemetery where my father is buried. And mm -hmm. so when I was a kid, when we would visit my father's grave, you always drop by. Houdini said, so one day it occurred to me, this is true. When they buried Houdini, they used the coffin that he had for his underwater escapes. He had a special coffin that was watertight and airproof and had rubber ring O seals around it to keep the water out. It was a very beautiful and ornate and metal coffin. And because they used it in his shows, that's what they buried Houdini in. And I thought to myself, if there's any corpse, any dead person that's in the ground all these years that's been in that type of coffin that would still be in good condition, it would be Houdini. And then I thought, what if there were evil scientists? Evil scientists who dug up Houdini I tried cloning him Ooh. just because they had a good DNA sample from an intact corpse that's been around over almost a hundred years. And then I thought, well, let's pretend Houdini wakes up on the operating table. And what does he say? He says, I'm Houdini. And what do the scientists say? Oh, he's crazy. He's not really Houdini. He's a clone. We created him. Nah, get rid of him. Terminate him. We've been practicing with other DNA and this one's a failure just like all the others. So they walk out the scientist and there's Houdini strapped down to the table and they put in the machines that are gonna kill him. And what does Houdini do? Escape. He does the only thing, that's it. He does what Houdini does, he escapes. And now Houdini is alive in New York City in modern day New York. And modern day New York, half of which looks like it did in 1926, but half of it is so alien to him. He yeah. is a fish out of water. And, of course, he gets into all sorts of incredible stuff, and the mad scientists want him back, and he has to escape, and all sorts of stuff. And it became a very big action movie that, we, in Hollywood, we call this, it's caught in development hell. It will probably <laughs> never get produced in my lifetime, uh, but we can always hope and pray that somebody decides, you know, this is a good idea. We should, hmm, we should get Robert Barracks to work some more on this. And they've asked me to rewrite it many times. So yes, this is the creativity that I enjoy, that if I was not a magician, I would be a writer. And, and I'm also in the middle of writing a book right now. The pandemic, of course, has yeah. slowed me down. I'm not doing as many shows. I'm writing a book right now called Performing at Private Parties. There are no tricks in this book. What this is, is how magicians can go to somebody's house and do a show in the best way Possible. possible possible because you all the magicians know how to do the tricks they've practiced all their lives of course they can do tricks but walking into somebody's living room walking into their restaurant walking into the <laughs> hotel do setting up in the backyard putting your show in the park that now becomes very different than just being able to do a bunch of tricks you have to know all the sorts of things about controlling the audience and controlling how to set up and how to tell the people who hire you, you're going to do it to make this show great. And that's, to me, as important as the actual magic tricks themselves. So all the stuff I'm writing in this book, performing at private parties, is going to be about all the stuff that isn't the actual tricks, just how to set up your show in the best way when it's somebody's home, a park, a restaurant, a hall, any place that is not a theater where the seats are bolted down. And that's it. I always say to people. Do you know why in a theater the seats are bolted down facing the stage? So you can have the audience's attention focused. The moment you're in somebody's house or a restaurant or a cafeteria or a park, the seats are wherever they want to sit and they can look around wherever they want. Yeah, yeah lots of distractions. A butterfly goes by, a helicopter goes by, a dog goes by. Everyone's looking everywhere. In the theater, 
when the seats are bolted down, they turn off all the lights. The lights mm -hmm. are only on the stage. You're focused on what's happening on the stage. That's it. So it's much tougher to do a show when it's not on the stage. And that's not in any magic book I've ever really seen. That's the only thing I see in magic books is how to do the magic tricks, not how to perform them in these situations. By yep. the way, uh, I would like to acknowledge uh, for our uh, viewers. We have uh, Mr. John Chaval. Ren Velasco is watching all the way from uh, Singapore. Uh, Tito David Matthews, Hank Rice is watching all the way from Hawaii as well. Frank and uh, yeah. By the way, uh, there's a comment over here coming from uh, let me just post it one coming from Mr. Glenn Bailey. Yes. How did you come up with the saying? If uh, the world is my stage, I want better lighting. That's that's you know a, what? Yep. I have a visual aid to go with that. Hold on. Sure. Uh, where was that one? Oh wait, did I delete it? Was Ah, uh, here you go. Look, he even Oof. sent me a picture. <laughs> I, I think it was <laughs> old, old picture of me. Yeah, that's old. old. At one point, I was much heavier than I am now. All right. Um, well, when I got, you know what? When I got married, I was two hundred twenty pounds. Huh? Boy, I'm trying to get back to my original weight, seven pounds eight ounces. All right. So, <laughs> um, the, interesting that you bring that up. Remember, I mentioned I was in law school. Part of law is copyright. Part okay. of law is copyright. That means that you get the copyright on a phrase. And like when McDonald's uh, has a phrase like um, two all beef patty, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, onions on a sesame seed bun, they can <laughs> copyright that phrase so that no one else can use that phrase. That phrase belongs to McDonald's. Okay. What I do in law school was copyright something just as part of the assignment. So while I did not invent the phrase, if all the world's a stage, I want better lighting. I copyrighted it. I checked the copyright it hadn't already been copyrighted, so I copyrighted it. I've never uh, uh, sued anybody for using it because it would cost me more money to sue them than, than it would be worth that I to make money back from it. But that's how I got the phrase "If all the world's a stage, I want better lighting." In in English, we call that type of person who enjoys the spotlight a ham, and uh -huh. you don't. Have a ham, as in a piece of pork, a ham. A ham is someone who really enjoys being in front of an audience. And and I like to say it like this. When the light comes on in my refrigerator, I do 10 minutes. Hey, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Nice lettuce. You know, it's just, that's someone who just loves performing is a ham. And um, that's that's how that phrase came. If all the world's a stage, I want better lighting. By the way, I would like to acknowledge uh, the great El Moldo watching from Mara Vista. Thank you very much for watching, sir. I earlier today. Okay. Um, Mar Vista is a neighboring community to where I live on the west side of Los Angeles. Uh, El Moldo is a magician named Bruce, uh, Bruce Schofield, and uh, he came over to my house. Again, I'm very lucky. I have a two-car garage. I think I saw the photo you posted on Facebook, right? Yeah. Most of the photo on Facebook. We have never parked a car in that garage. It is nothing <laughs> but magic in there uh, and my Zoom studio and stuff. So, uh, yeah, that's a good thing. And again, just, just again, here's a very important thing I must add. It isn't the money you make from magic that's important. It's the money you save. Wow, mm. that's a, that, that may be the most important thing I've said this entire hour. Not the money you make, it's the money you save. Mm. So I saved all my money when I was making money. So that when those times came, that I went, oh my God, nobody's calling me. I have no shows coming in. I was okay, but I bought a house. I bought a house in Los Angeles. Houses in Los Angeles are extremely expensive. Expensive, yep. <sighs> but the genius part about the garage is I get to deduct all the square footage of the garage space off my taxes each year as a business. Oh. That's why I have all my magic in the garage and I park my cars on the street because of all my magic in the garage. I get to deduct that because I don't know there's a business expense. I really got to keep my magic trick somewhere. It's in this garage. This room that I'm sitting in right now is another deduction. Oh boy. So all sorts of square footage of my house that I get to deduct because I'm legitimately a full-time magician. Magician. Yep. Got to make this work. Okay. I know it's uh, pretty late up uh, in your place. I think it's 1230 uh, morning. Anyway, let's a few more questions here before I let you go. Okay, yeah. do you have any one-liners for magicians since you've written uh, lots of uh, books or something? Are, do you have any one-liner for magicians? Uh, I mean, have you written 
a book with regards to one-liner for magicians or no, I, I've contributed that. as a matter of fact uh, people have stolen my lines and written them in their books for okay, magicians sorry. no 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 there's there's a magician who's dead now named Aldo Colombini okay, Aldo, yeah. Aldo Colombini published a couple of books of lines for magicians okay. and I saw him in my show at the Magic Castle with a pencil writing down my lines and I went Aldo what are you doing those are my lines. He goes, no, 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 you, you, you didn't come up with those lines. Nobody comes up with their lines. You just heard them somewhere else, and I'm writing them down because you don't own them. I went, no, no, Aldo, I wrote those lines. I came up with those lines. And he went, no, 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 nobody comes up with their own lines. And he put those lines in his books. And you know what I realized? Only hacks who can't come up with their own original material believe that other people can't come up with original yeah, material. Man. Yeah. So very important. I know Aldo Colombini is revered for his card work and his magic. And they say you should only speak good of the dead. Yes. So I must say Aldo Colombini is dead? Good. <laughs> anyway, sorry, sorry if I went to that topic. Okay, in my case, I don't know if this is a one liner. Uh I don't know if this is original, but I've been using this one, you know. If you combine a comedian and a magic, and if you if you combine comedy and magic, that will bring you into comedian. So, ma comedy, magic, comedian. I don't know. Do you, you get my point? Of course. Again, the problem with lines like this is, it's like a tailored suit. It doesn't fit me, even though it mm. fits you. So it's very difficult to write. I mean, I, I, part of my career is I do write lines for other magicians. I've written jokes for David Copperfield, and David Copperfield has giving me checks. Hold, hold on, don't go. Wait right here. Yeah, yeah, sure. Show no, no, no. us the check. <laughs> uh, oh, 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 not, it's not the actual yeah. check. It's a copy of the check, okay? I, I cash the check, I assure you, okay? <laughs> but uh, as a matter of fact, uh, oh, maybe the next to last David Copperfield special, my name is in the credits uh, for writing Ooh. the jokes and stuff like that. Uh, but again, in David's case... I got to watch David's show many, many times, and I wrote the jokes from David's point of view, the way David would say them. I had to get inside the other person's head. So I do write jokes for other people. Uh, Joseph Gabriel, who everyone knows for his very beautiful Dove, Dove Act and stuff. What you don't realize is that Dove Act is also only like 12 minutes long. When he works on a cruise ship, he has to do 90 minutes of material. Ooh. So he does that 12 minute Dove Act, and then he has many talking routines. And I've written jokes for Joseph Gabriel. I've written jokes for many, many different magicians and stuff. But each time, it is like going to a tailor. I have no jokes just off the rack that you can go to the store and I can give them. When it comes to joke writing, I must ask them questions about themselves. I must ask them how would they think, what they think is funny, so the jokes sound organic. Like mm. they came from that person's mouth not like they came from my mouth. So that's the difficult learning jokes. By but the way, I, we were supposed to have, I mean, I the first time I got in touch with you is when I contacted you. Uh, I was trying to invite you to go to Manila to do a lecture. I think you were in Japan by that time. Right. So I the was thing is, again, the pandemic went. Uh, do you miss giving out lectures and attending uh, conventions? Of course. <sighs> Very much so. Uh, Abbott's magic get together is going on right now. Yeah. I very much wanted to be there. Um, a very sad thing happened. An old magician friend of mine died mm. uh, three years ago, and he asked me to be the executor of his estate. He had no family, so he asked specifically that he should be buried in the cemetery in Colon, Michigan. And I had to take care of all the arrangements, and we had to get him a tombstone. Again, I'm going to walk up and show you something. He was a magician who had performed in the 1960s and 1970s with his own touring magic show in America. He wasn't famous, but in the areas that he worked on the East Coast, he was well known. very well known. He worked shopping malls and schools and fairs. And if you've ever been to Colon, Michigan, where the Abbots get together is, many famous magicians are buried there. But I wanted his tombstone to stand out. We're different, yeah. To look different. Wait right here. Okay, I'm coming back. I'm coming back. I'm coming back. No problem. 
Oh, once again, guys, you're watching Let's Talk Magic. This is episode number 25. My name is Chubster, and there you go. This Winsing. is the post from his show, I Had This Made Into His Tombstone. This oh, wow. is his tombstone. So it still says at the top of his tombstone, in person, in person. on the grave. It says, in person, Windley. All this, and at the bottom, instead of saying this, it says, P.S., you picked the three of clubs. Because this way, every magician who goes through the cemetery, I know will do a card trick for their friends, where they uh -huh. make them pick the three of clubs and then go, oh, I can't find your card. And then they will wait till they get this man's grave just so they can read off the bottom. It says, you picked you the three of clubs. Club. That's a nice one, huh? I, I, thought, I thought my friend, he was quite the character. He would enjoy that for all eternity people coming to his grave for one last magic trick. I mm. thought this way he could always do magic even when he was dead. Okay, two more topics to go. Yes. Uh, you're very lucky that you're living next to the magic castle. Yes. And how was it like performing for the first time? I know, you, of course, you were called to take the place of somebody. And right now, you, I know, you, you are a frequent magic castle uh, visitor. Yes. So how about well, in my case, my dream is of course to not perform but to visit the magic castle. If you come so, to Los Angeles, I will show you a good time, Chubster. Leave it to me. Trust it. The thing is, maybe after five years or so, I don't we don't know what I know, because of this COVID something, we don't know how travel will be like for the I'm coming. Sure you'll be able to get here eventually. Let's see. Here's something you should know about me. I used to live down the block from the magic castle on the same street literally just a block and a half away. When I first moved out to Los Angeles and I did the It's Magic show, there was a little apartment building down the block from the Magic Castle. In this building, there lived many magicians, including Christopher Hart. Oh, the, yeah. The hand thing. thing. Right? Uh, Scott Servine, Ray Pierce. And there was an empty apartment there. And I took the apartment. So for many years, whenever somebody tripped, died, or broke a leg at the Magic Castle... <laughs> I would get a phone call, Robert, can you be here before we put down the phone? And literally, it was quicker to walk to the Magic Castle than to drive to the Magic Castle because in the block and a half to drive to the Magic Castle, you would hit red lights. But to walk there, I was right there. I actually hold a record at the Magic Castle. I have performed in two different rooms at the Magic Castle on the same night. Oh, One wow. night, I was performing in the big show, The Palace of Mystery. And besides the big Palace of Mystery show... They have a smaller showroom called The Parlor. Mm. The magician who was supposed to do the late shows at The Parlor didn't show up. And okay. so they ran through the Magic Castle going, is there any magician here who can do a show for them? And I went, well, I can do a show. They went, no, no, no. They just saw your show. I went, I've got more material. <laughs> a completely different half hour show that I walked from the big theater to the small theater and did for them. And then when they went, ladies and gentlemen, a man you've never seen before. And it was me that went, we just saw this guy. But I had all different tricks. So, but you asked what it was like the first time I performed in the Magic Castle. It was great. Mm. I had just done the It's Magic show. And again, this was right after I had won the FISM trophy for comedy. As a matter of fact, Bill Larson was still alive. Oh. In the, Bill Larson, the founder of the Magic Castle. As a matter of fact, not only was he alive, I had won the first prize in the gold medal competition, that uh, trophy I held up before. To enter FISM, you needed the signature of someone to sponsor you. Endorse something like that. Endorse me. Bill Larson signed my application to go to FISM. Ah, I wish I still had it just for his signature. I, uh, I have another thing on my wall here that he signed for me, but... Um, that was great. So that first week at the Magic Castle, it was great because the week before had been Joseph Gabriel, Mike Caveney, and Tina Leonard. Mm. Then it was me, and I forget who I worked with. Sorry, it's so long ago. And then the following week was like Lance Burton. So I'm like, wow, wow I'm with all the stars of magic. You, know, <laughs> you don't always get the stars of magic at the Magic Castle, but you always do get great magicians. Um, so I wasn't nervous because again, I've been performing since I'm 11 years old. And like I said, when the refrigerator light goes on, I do 10 minutes just for the fruits and the vegetables. <laughs> so 
know, but again, the great thing about the Magic Castle is, as opposed to that book I was talking about, performing at private parties, when you perform at private parties, those people aren't there to see a magic show. Yes. They're there. It's a birthday party. They're there because it's an anniversary. They're there because it's a picnic. They're there because it's a school. You're just an extra added treat. Eh, maybe they want to see the magic show. Maybe they don't want to see the magic show. That's that's what my book is all about, how to get them to really want to see the magic show. But when you go to the Magic Castle, those people have come to the Magic Castle because they want to see a magic see. show. And the seats are bolted down facing the stage. They turn off the like this. And you have their complete and undivided attention. attention you don't yeah. have to worry about the table of food over there. You don't have to worry about, you know, a car going by or anything. Nope, they are focused on you. So the Magic Castle is truly a wonderful place to perform because everyone there is so excited to see great magic. Well, hopefully uh, one of these uh, days, uh, upcoming years, I can visit uh, maybe Hollywood, you, I can visit you with the Magic Castle. My, my, my brother and my uh, dad are in New York and New Jersey. So if ever should I be going there, first up New Jersey, then LA, California. <laughs> uh, by the way, Robert, again, thank you very much for doing this interview. Uh, can you perform something for the viewers? Will there be uh, something? Sure, I will do one uh, quick trick. Um, we've talked about Zoom shows and stuff. And yes, how yes. I also mentioned how because of the act with all the medals, I hate anything that requires setup. The other thing I hate is anything electronic. I oh. hate anything electronic because the, the, I know if there's a circuit, there's a chance that the circuit won't work, yes. the battery will die, the button won't work, and all these telephone tricks that people love doing and stuff. The problem is if they don't have an internet connection, if the server goes down, you're in trouble. You've yeah. bought wiki test or any of the others you know and then oh no oh, no oh, oh, wait not oh sorry my phone's not um working. Not, not working okay but for my zoom shows i wanted to do that type of touch the screen trick yes screen trick but but again then you have to have a electronic overlay on the screen where they put things up the way you have let's talk magic around us right now i'm an idiot that's beyond me yeah. so i came up with a way to do these type of things both live and on Zoom. Okay. I'll give you a perfect example. You know, during the pandemic, lots of people have gotten pets. Yeah. They to talk to, they're all alone, they're in their house, they need someone. You know, there's lots of different pets you can get. Let's think of some of them. Uh, let's see if I can get into the camera. I'll here. put you all, uh, on the screen right this. Oh, there yeah, we are. I'm trying to get uh, in frame. That's my problem. Uh, oh, let's think. Oh, there we go. There we go. It's like this. Uh, okay. Let's think of a type of pet you can get. There's lots of ways to, to start getting a pet. You can uh, go to the pet shop and get it. That's one way. You can adopt a pet. I, I actually misspelled that. It says adapt a pet. It's adopt a pet. If you adapted a pet, you would have dog ears or something like that. <laughs> Right. And, and like I said, there's all sorts of different pets. You get a snake or a rabbit. Don't, don't get a snake. <laughs> rabbit, the, the snake will eat the rabbit, okay? You can get a parrot, a fish, a hamster, a dog, a turtle, any of these. Mm -hmm. Here's, Chubster, you're going to be the spectator for me. Okay. I want you to uh, give me a number between uh, 5 and 20. Any number you want. 7. 7, you're sure? You can change yep. your mind. If you want. Uh, Whatever. 7. I'll stick, I'll stick to 7. Okay, okay, I'm not making you change your mind. Whatever number you want, I didn't know what number you were going to want. We didn't prearrange this. I'm going to yep. count around the circle to seven. And then to make it even more random, I'm going to go mm -hmm. back. That same number, seven around one way, seven around the other way. So there's no way I could possibly know where you would wind up. Okay. Start. Starting. One, two, three, four. Five, Five, six, six seven. Oh, a hamster. Hamster's good, but wait, wait. We said we were going to go backwards. So that same number, seven. One, One two, two, three, three four, four, five, five six, six, seven. seven. Ooh, a cat. The cat. Cats are nice. Now, you know, I'm not like regular performers. I happen to be part psychic and part telepath. Okay. I'm a psychopath. So that means that I knew you would say... Uh, Cat. Oh, wow. Nice. Now, 
Yes, of course, this is a great thing because it's a simple thing that's flat, needs no reset, and I can carry it around with me to any show I want. And this is the creativity part. I'll actually tell you where this comes from. All credit to Max Maven. Max Maven reminded me that in an 1895 book. That's where the best secrets are. They're in books. Professor Hoffman's More Magic from 1895. There is a trick he calls the capital Q. It's the basis of all the ones you've seen on TV where they touch the screens and stuff. But the actual version that's in the capital Q in the book, you lay out coins on a table in the shape of a Q. Why do you lay out the coins in the shape of a Q? I don't know. And why, when you do the ones on screen that you've seen all the magicians do, why do they have that odd shape of a Q? Somehow, in all of magic, I'm the only person who realized that a thought bubble yep correct bubble is the right shape for doing the trick so when i say oh let's think of an animal and i hold it up to my head like i'm thinking yep. of an animal now it makes perfect sense why i have this shape which i need thought bubbles, to... yep. now i'm actually writing a little uh, booklet on on this trick too because you don't just have to do it with animals like mm. this um, let's see. I, I can you wait one second while I walk over to the other side of my office? And uh, no worries, no worries. Thank you very much mm -hmm. again, guys. Uh -huh. I would like to thank Mr. Robert Bax for uh, again doing uh, agreeing to do this lecture. This is uh, episode number 25 of Let's Talk Magic. Next week, our broadcast will be at 11 a.m. in the morning. Okay, oh, oh wait a minute, that's what a nice superhero. One. Are you going to think of hmm. anything? So it's You're adaptable to any theme, adaptable to any theme. And again, you could do it on screen with the overlays and the OBS and the things for Zoom that are way beyond me. But I enjoy just holding up a, a card or something like that. I find it works so much better, easier, less to worry about. So I can put all my effort into the performance, as I've been saying, this entire interview. And not have to worry about the setup or the electronics or anything like that. Yeah. RJ, thank you very much for watching and for your comment. So again, Mr. Robert Bax, maraming salamat. Thank you very much for spending your time with me. Let's talk magic. I know it's uh, way past uh, midnight already in your place. and I'm in show business. Okay. I stay up this late every night. It's okay. <laughs> but anyway, thank you very much. And uh, again, thanks for sharing your insight today. Yes, coming from Mr. Robert Laru. Again, for those who'd li who are, would like to get hold of some of uh, Robert Bax's uh, products, you can visit the... Website, it's www.robertbacks.com slash shop. There's my great machine. There's my newspaper trick. Oh, boy. <laughs> and, of course, you can also visit his Facebook page, uh, Robert Bax. And, and you can oh, contact me there. Uwe is watching from Germany. Uwe, thank you very much for watching all the way from Germany. Dank, and Uwe. Uh, see, Uwe, I have lots of, uh, my guess is a very uh, uh, multilingual. Am I correct? Dumkoff, I said, but yes. <laughs> and uh, again, Sir Bruce, Sir Bruce, thank you very much for dropping by. And my good friend from Singapore, again. Terry uh, Marcus. Still remember uh, the show when you were in Singapore? Yeah. Um, yeah, Mr. Okay, yeah I was all blur then, wasn't I? Yeah, okay. That's more Singapore language. Okay, yes. And I love the Red Bull routine. Yeah, Frank from Frank Third. It's available on my website. Frank, you do a very good version of it. I thank you. Uh, I didn't get, go to sleep during the, your show this time. Well, thank because you. it's I'm still early for well. you. Mr. Okay. So once again, uh, to all our viewers, thank you very much for tuning in. Uh, any final uh, thoughts? Any final shout-outs that you want to do? Uh, that you want to... Uh, any final... Chubster. Thing? I have yes. to thank you, Chubster. Chubster, all credit to you. I am sincerely grateful because you doing this series of shows, not just with me, but with all the magicians, spreads the love of magic throughout the world. And these will be on your Facebook page forever. So the problem with the performances is, is once it's over, it's over, it's gone. When it's on Facebook, it's forever. Yes. So look at this, see this again. And every time they have to thank you, Chubster, for everything you do for magic. We can tell that you love magic with all your heart. It comes through with all these questions that you ask. 
I'm sincerely grateful to you for having me as a guest. I wish everyone out there in your audience safety and health. Please stay safe, and I look forward to seeing you all in person when this is all over. Well, once again, Robert, thank you very much for uh, joining me. And uh, again, thank you very much, and good night to you. So once again, that was Mr. Robert Bax uh, broadcasting all the way from uh, L.A. or from California. So, guys, thank you very much for watching uh, this episode. Maraming salamat for those who tuned in. Robert, come to Hawaii, says Mr. Uh, <laughs> uh, Glenn Bailey. And uh, again, to Jonathan Santiago, thank you very much as well. To RJ Clemente, maraming salamat din for watching. Don't forget, my next uh, episode will be on uh, August 14th. Uh, the broadcast time will be uh, 11 a.m. And my guest next week will be none other than Mr. David K. or Silly Billy. Topic will be entertaining children uh, with magic and comedy. Should you have any further questions, regarding, should you be having any questions with regards to our guest for next week, please prepare them and you can punch them in at our uh, comment box during the episode. So once again, guys, this is Chubster. Thank you very much for watching Let's Talk Magic. I will be seeing you next week. Good afternoon and God bless. Stay safe. Stay sanitized. Don't forget to wear your face mask and face shield. See you next time. See you next week. 2 p.m. Let's talk magic. Chubster out of here.